Welcome to Sinister Heroes. I'm your host, Danny Iniquitous. Thank you for tuning in. Today's episode is about the Alchemist Artificer. This actually came up uh, as I was talking to one of the subscribers who mentioned uh, the Artificer class. And specifically, this is not being that optimal. And I said, you know what? Let me... Let's really get into this and see if we can turn this into something that can really appeal to us. So, um, again, we read the comments. We love to comment with you guys. We love to talk to you guys. You guys have wonderful ideas. It's so great for us to, to, to see some of those things and some of the awesome stories of the things you guys do. So, please keep uh, keep commenting. And uh, without further ado, we're going to jump right into the Artificer. The Artificer is a unique class. It comes to us from a book, Eberron Rising from the Last War, so it was not included in the player's handbook, which makes it rather unique as it is the only new class ever created at this point. Um, it has a cool grouping of act abilities kicked into it. Uh, it gains medium armor, shields, simple weapons, ritual casting, Half it's a half caster, and it gains the ability to create magical items now depending on what art artificer infusions you choose would depict what kind of things you make or what kind of items you decide to create or modify that already exists now because it's magical items i suggest talking to your dm about it and making sure they know what's going on um just so that way they can keep balance in the game that being said um it is it's very unique of a class because it gives you a lot of options. Because you have medium armor and shields, you can get a little close to the front line or battle it out if you have to. Um, and you gain cantrips, so you don't have to necessarily be dexterity based or using a weapon of any sort. You can use cantrips depending on what they are to get the job done. So you have a lot of intricate things like that and spell slots that you can use and ritual casting to help complement your spells and make them last a little bit longer. At mechanically as a kit it kind of reflects a little bit of like a warlock in the sense that you can make these things these artificial infusions kind of follow along that suit of eldritch invocations and you get them and you can switch them out some of them are based on certain level requirements so definitely it's gonna take a lot of reading I'm sorry you're just gonna have to read through uh, a lot to really gain your understanding and it's very built around using magical items the higher level you go the more important things you get from having magical items attuned to you so make sure to talk to your DM about this class uh, because of those intricate things that have to do with magic items and whether or not you become more powerful or not Okay, so some of the skills and abilities you get as an Artificer in the core class, I want to just mention just so that way you have an understanding as to what they do. Uh, first and foremost, at 7th level, you gain access to Flash of Genius. So when you or another creature uh, makes an ability check or saving throw, you can use your reaction and add your intelligence modifier to the roll. You can only use this a certain amount of times equal to your intelligence modifier so if you have four uh plus four to intelligence you can use this four times you gain uh this back at the end of a long rest this is a great defensive thing this is great if you desperately need to make a check to make it through something maybe you need to make a stealth check and you're very close to the line make it use it you know it's a great it's a great defensive tools it'll save you spell saving throws big effects things like that traps at the worst possible time this can be very very good for that at level 10, you get Magic Item Adept. This is important because it builds th for, uh, throughout the rest of the game, where you can now attune four Magic Items at once, and you can craft a Magic Item of ra Rarity of Common or Uncommon, and it takes a quarter of the normal time, and it costs you half as much gold. Depending on how your, play your DM runs crafting, this will affect that if you have the time and the longevity in a campaign to do so. It's easy for you to do and this is just to craft these common magical items yeah you're gonna need a book full of common items and uncommon items and go through the list and concept what you're gonna need and the time it's gonna take you to do so in relation to its usefulness in the longevity uh, it's a little bit of thinking you do need to kind of plan it out because crafting will take time to do so but you can now officially make magical items that aren't part of your artificer infusions so Take that into consideration. Again, it's a lot of reading, but if you're going to be an artificer, you need high intelligence. Uh, at 11th level, you gain spell storing 
item. You can now store a spell in an object. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can touch one simple or martial weapon or one item that you can use as a spellcasting focus. As an artificer, you can use artisan tools that you just have or thieves tool as spellcasting focuses and you get an ability early on that lets you create another artisan tool if you need one and don't have one available to you. But um, with spell storing item, you can use a spell casting focus if you don't have a simple or martial weapon. And choosing a first or second level spell from the artificer spell list that requires one action to cast and you don't need to have it prepared. Uh, while holding the object, you can take an action to produce the spell's effect from it. Using your spell casting ability modifier, which would be intelligence, if the spell requires concentration, the creature must concentrate. The spell stays in the object until it's been used a number of times equal to twice your intelligence modifier or until you use this feature again to store a spell in an object. So that gives you just a huge boost to your actual spell slots because you get to use the spell repeatedly. Uh, and then, then again, you can just restore it the next time you get the ability to do so after a long rest once you've depleted everything. It's a great way to make your spells last significantly longer. That's really all it is. Because you're a half caster, you do not have the spell slots as a normal caster does have, but this gives a nice buffer for you to be able to do so. Uh, at 14th level, you get Magic Item Savant, so now you can attune five magic items at once, and you ignore all clays class, race, and spell level requirements for attuning or using a magic item. At 18th level, you get Magic Item Master, and you can now attune six magic items at once. Attuning a magic item is very important to the accessibility of the item because you can't really use it unless you're attuned to it, and you usually only have an attunement of three. Why this is important so much, A, Magic items that require attunement are strong, very powerful, and can do a lot for you, depending on whether or not they're innately defensive or offensive, or do specialized debilitating effects, or just preventative effects. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what the effects are, they just all are strong, and you can pick and choose whether or not you want them, because again, you might be able to craft them depending on how you are and how you DM rules about magic items existing in your world. But the reason why it's important, and that's if you make it up to this high level in a campaign, it's because of Soul of Artificer. At 20th level, you, do, you develop a mystical, mystical connection to your magic items in which you draw on for protection. You gain a plus one bonus to all saving throws per magic item you are currently attuned to. If you are reduced to zero HP and not outright killed, you can use a reaction to end one of those attunements uh, and one of your Artificer Infusions, I'm sorry, causing you to drop to 1 HP instead of 0. That is huge defensively. On top of whatever things you might already be proficiently with, you now have, if you get all 6 items, you get plus 6 to your saving throws. Not including, including your own benefits and whatever saving throws you might be proficient with, or whatever things you might have gained alongside that might have given you those proficiencies. Again, a lot of people like to multi-class and jump in and out of things. If you end up in a game where you hit 20th level, as an artificer, you are wildly hard to kill. I played with a friend who had this artificer that hit level 20 and his armor class was 24. And he was a monster. You couldn't hit him, you couldn't make him make saving throws to compensate. He was almost as immortal as you could possibly get as an artificer, which is a very interesting and cool concept. So. If you're in a campaign that goes along level, this is a lot of stuff that's built into your kit normally, and it's important to mention. Uh, so I'm going to get into a little bit of conceiving what a artificer will be, and more into the alchemist subclass. So when conceiving the artificer, you have to take into consideration magic as a whole in the world you're playing in. I like to consider wizards as kind of like a political position. Uh, because you don't necessarily have to be automatically selected to go into wizard school because you know magic. It might be very difficult to get in, it might be very costly to get in, so it might be policed very heavily by nobility and people in positions of power to restrict the amount of wizards on the, in the world and to restrict the availability of just anybody becoming a wizard and to cause people to need their help to get through wizarding school in order to be able to be the full potential that they are capable of of a wizard. 
So it creates these ties to these organizations or these families that might use that for political gain, evil, tyranny, whatever it is. So in keeping with that concept, again, I kind of just hate wizards anyway. So um, anything to tack on a reason to dislike them is really up my alley. But take that into consideration. And then in my mind, an artificer would be someone who can build. He's not actually... I know you're casting magic in the game, and I understand how that works because they are spells, but in my mind, an artificer wouldn't really do that as they would replicate the effects of a spell. Like say they were super smart and they just saw something happen and they replicated it by using technology that they've created. I like that idea a little bit better than I like the concepts of magic and, and making this just another spellcasting class. And using that as to making it kind of a rebellious thing where, where maybe an artificer rolls into town and just gives like powerful artifacts and items and weapons into the people that are impoverished or at the at the heel of the tyrann the tyrannical people on top of them and they're able to use this magic to cause chaos and maybe end those those conflicts or end those rules and, and change the landscape of the world being that kind of like instant like walk into town and just start destabilizing the whole area is a very cool concept like it's it's very evil in that aspect of like you're now just uprooting everything like this is like a chaotic evil kind of a character because you're just creating these items that level the playing field you're creating these items and now you have this strong group of militant people that are just grouped up laying siege to a town and just suppressing them under their order and their law and here you go giving people the ability to cast spells by using items you know like it changes the landscape it creates this kind of very devious character and very evil notoriety behind you uh and i like that you're highly intelligent so maybe you're really really arrogant and really just just deciding to overthrow people because maybe you did want to be a wizard and they were denied that you were denied that ability because they just didn't like you or they didn't want you to have this kind of power because of maybe it was where you came from your race your family anything whatever you wanted to connect that to your background and now you're trying to destabilize the world of the wizard and cause it to rip apart and have them lose everything Maybe that arrogance is part of it. Maybe maybe that's how you became who you are. And that creates an interesting character. That creates a character that works both sides. That's allegiances are really only there just for themselves to move forward and advance how they feel it's necessary. It makes you... It, it's a cool way to make it very, very dark, very evil, very rebellious. You don't necessarily have to be good because depending on how that story writes out, you're good or bad depending on who who's on your side at the end and who has the pen writing the story. So there's a possibility of that character becoming something very dark and very, very mischievous and very, very dangerous to be around. And they only use their intelligence to get through everything. You know, it's a very smart way to play it. It's a very, like, scan the area, learn everything you can, learn the power players, and you're not charismatic. You're just dangerous. Selecting the Alchemist at third level gives you the tool proficiency in Alchemist Supplies, which is important because you'll need that further down the line. It also gives you the ability Experimental Elixir. This is important because you're going to be using this all the time. Uh, you can make an Experimental Elixir uh, one after every long rest. You just need an empty flask to do so. If you want to make additional ones, it's going to cost you a spell slot. So just try to use them daily, uh, depending on where you are in your campaign. Uh, you can administer it to someone else by just pouring it down their throat, I guess. Um, also, other people can use it. It's not restricted to just you. At 6th level, you can make 2, and at 15th level, you can make 3. Now, you roll a uh, d6 in order to determine what you get. First and foremost, you get healing, which is great. It's a free healing potion. It'll save somebody at some point. Uh, if you roll a 2, you get swiftness, which increases your walking speed by 10 feet by an hour. All right, you know, I mean, in case you need to be fast, in case you need to get somewhere, speed and combat can be strategic, especially if you're ranger, you're trying to outmaneuver something or trying to kite something, maybe, depending on what it is you're fighting. Uh, resilience gives you a plus one to your AC for 10 minutes, which is very useful. Boldness gives the drinker the ability to add a D4 to every attack roll and saving throw that they make for the next minute. Very big buff especially for fighters or someone that's doing a lot of regular attacks. Uh, flight, you gain uh, flying speed for 
of 10 feet for 10 minutes. Uh, and transformation, your body is transformed by the altar self spell. Um, the, the drink determines the transformation caused by the spell and the effects last for 10 minutes. A lot of these are like not necessarily combat oriented. I mean, boldness and healing, yeah, they, they definitely fill into that kind of situation. Flight, transformation, those can be used for espionage, for getting in somewhere. Maybe you need to transform to look like someone else and you have that and you know you have that. That's a great way to just drink it, look like someone else and just get into somewhere. Or, or, or walk in somewhere undetected looking like somebody that belongs there, open a door, let your friends in. Or, or, or change something or, or really try and deceive a scenario and give you the benefit. Again, charisma is not your best stat. But maybe giving this to someone else who would, who is might give you that chance. Might give you that availability to get in somewhere where it's not. Plus, you you should just drink it whenever. I mean, it's the altered self spell. You can do a lot of cool things with it. Just drink it. Pretend like you're Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Just drink it and go berserk and run into combat. Like, just do it to intimidate someone. You know, make them feel unbalanced. Do that, you know, and just cause these other things to happen. Flying speed can be useful. Yes, you do have a flying speed of 10 feet. But that doesn't mean you can only fly up 10 feet or over 10 feet. You can fly up 10 feet and then fly up and then fly up and fly up and keep going. So in that 10 feet over 10 minutes makes a difference. You can go significantly far with it and it can be very intricate, especially if you have a destination. So you're trying to get onto a second floor in the middle of the combat. So you're trying to get on a cliff so you're safe from melee attackers. You can use these things and it's free. It's something you get every day, so always use it in whatever scenario you're in, because when you're not gonna use it, it's not really gonna feel like anything really important happened, and that really distincts you from being a regular artificer. So you wanna get used to this, you wanna get used to the idea of being like this plague doctor who's sitting there mixing chemicals all day and trying to design the, you know, create things uh, and create heals and tonics or whatever, or just change the face of something. Like, it's a very cool concept. I do wish transformation let you decide the effect of someone else who drinks it, because then you could poison somebody with it and turn them into a rabbit or something and cause them to be wildly confused and, and, and just trick people and do things like that. But it has to happen, so maybe you can work your, with your DM and cause that effect to happen or cause something similar so that way it can be used in more uh, interesting ways. At 5th level, you gain access to Alchemical Savant. Whenever you cast a spell using your Alchemist Supplies as the spellcasting focus, you gain a bonus to one roll of the spell. The roll must restore hit points or be a damage roll that deals acid, fire, necrotic, or poison damage. And the bonus equals your intelligence modifier. A lot of the times, this is just going to up the damage of a spell or a healing by whatever... Uh, your intelligence modifier is if at fifth level you have a four or five it's going to be basically like casting the spell at a higher level uh, it's a great way to kind of keep pace uh, with your spell damage and adding a little bit extra to it healing again it's one of those things i hate to do but it is something that can make a difference in the combat and in a fight so and you might be making potions anyway through experimental elixir you can't really get away from it in this subclass so you kind of just have to deal with it but you don't ever have to be a primary healer yeah if somebody goes down walk over maybe feed them an elixir or whatever but for alchemical savant what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go through your spells anyway and look for things that have material components that's going to be really really important to what you do uh, like at this point you have Melf's Acid Arrow, so that would be my go-to spell to cast all the time. And I would just keep throwing Acid Arrows everywhere. Uh, but and it would work, it would increase the damage, and it would increase uh, the damage for one roll, not all the rolls included. But it helps, and it's cool, it's a nice flavor, it's a nice add-on, it's a little bit of a buff that makes you a little bit better with using certain spells. So again, half caster, any, any character that needs to cast spells to be effective, Studying and understanding that spell list is really going to determine the full strength and capability of your character, not really one or two abilities. At ninth level, you gain access to Restorative Reagents. This lets you add temporary hit points to any character that uses your experimental elixir. You get a 2d6 plus your intelligence modifier as temporary HP for anyone who actually drinks the experimental elixir. 
Also, you gain access to Lesser Restoration. You do not need to keep it prepared. Um, and you do not need to use a spell slot to cast it. You can cast it a number of times equal to your intelligence modifier, and you regain all those uses once you've finished a long rest. It's not flashy. It's not like you're going to run into combat and go, hey, React Restorative Reagents! Like, it's not going to happen, but it's going to affect how you do things, and it's going to be a great effect to that. Somebody's getting knocked down constantly, and you're kind of just dropping to 1 HP and then picking them up and they're dropping to 1 HP. Giving a creature the healing restorative elixir at that point will make it beneficial because you might survive a hit and be able to escape what scenario they're in. Giving somebody the experimental elixir that gives you a bonus to AC and a temporary HP makes you a nice little buffer for survivability. Maybe toss it onto a wizard or something or that you might hate, but you know they might be in there and they might be targeted and it might be beneficial to let them hold on to it so they can just survive a little longer, especially if they're concentrating on a big, big spell. So, again, defensive buff, uh, straight across, almost passive, lesser restoration without any kind of use, any kind of restriction on it besides five times a day for free is, is a really strong ability. At 15th level, you gain access to Chemical Mastery. This has some flavor text to it that states you have been exposed to so many chemicals that they pose little risk to you and you can use them to quickly end certain ailments. This gives you resistance to acid and poison damage and you are now immune to the poison condition. It's level 15 to gain immunity to poison condition but it's still viable and it's a great thing to not have to worry about. Also, you can cast greater restoration and heal without expending a spell slot, without preparing the spell, and without providing the material component. Provided you use the alchemist supplies as a spell casting focus, once you cast either of these spells with this feature, you can cast it again until you finish a long rest. The acid damage, the poison damage, those resistances is going to help you a lot because it's resistance and at 15th level you can be hit with basically anything at any point. The availability to cast greater restoration and heal is a wildly powerful ability. Those are high level cleric spells. High level cleric spells. Those are very important for, for a very easy reason once you've actually studied and seen what the spells can do. It's powerful and it's for free and you don't need to prepare it. The, the Alchemist really has this healing ability built into it. You do have to use it a little bit from time to time. It gives you a lot of defensive buffs. It makes you very, very defensive and buff oriented, which is all right. It's not particularly my favorite thing, but the fact that you gain these things like chemical mastery and the resistances really, really set you, sell, set you apart. That you can put yourself in dangerous scenarios like if Cloud Kill was going around, you can walk into it. You know, like you can do things like that and, and really get into a scenario like that that most other characters could not be in and it's beneficial to you. So don't sleep too hard on this ability because Greater Restoration and Heal are wildly powerful and to cast them for free is great. Two resistances is awesome and an immunity works out to your benefit. Our final thoughts. The Artificer is a very complicated class. You really need to do your homework in order to understand how it works, what infusions you want to build, and how you want to build your character around those abilities. All of the subclasses are really intricate in figuring those things out and what to do with them. With the Alchemist, you inherently absorb these abilities for healing and buffing. Healers are just never never really my thing. I just don't get it, don't like it, it's not my thing, I don't enjoy it. But understand that in order for a healer to be good, all you need is the access to cast one or two healing spells. And you can you can change the face of combat. Especially in D&D &D because someone at 1 HP does the same damage they do at full HP. You are very capable of changing the face of combat by keeping so many people alive with the various uses of experimental elixir and your normal spell slot. Uh, and also spell storing item and all those things that you can do that can really buff you up. Like put Melf's Acid Arrow in your spell storing item and just keep firing it, you know? Like you don't really need a lot of concentration unless you're doing something specific. But 
you can have these things going and you have like accessibility to use your to really f grip into the foundations of the character and use those rp elements this is more of a character i would play in a heavier rp scenario than a heavier combat scenario because i don't like healing it's not my thing you do have plenty of offensive capabilities because you have access to a lot of really good spells that you can use and you gain that little buff with experimental elixir so maybe you're running around casting green flame blade in the middle of a poison field like you know like you can do things like that that nobody else really could um it's cool to create those concepts you have a lot of infusions that can make you tanky make you offensive make you anything it gives you that great custom ability so don't rely too heavily on any particular subclass of the artificer and really in like dive into those in artificer infusions because that's going to make you strong that's going to make you dangerous that's going to make you this insanely powerful character um and really work with that Again, I would play this in a heavy RP kind of a game because I would want to be that super smart bad guy who's just mixing chemicals all day like Singe from League of Legends or like like trying to be, um, you know, an artificer is really a lot like uh, Jason Victor from League of Legends or, or the recent show they had on Netflix because they are just using technology to make magic. And that's really what they're doing and how it incorporates into it. It's very easy to play Victor. Uh, from League of Legends. It's very easy to play Singe from League of Legends being an alchemical um, uh, alchemist artificer. Like you can do those things because that's inherent to their character. That's a great wealth of inspiration from those characters. And they are dark and, and can be mischievous and just dangerous for a world around them. And that's what I like about the artificer because you're not conforming to something. You're almost doing everything on your own. You're using your intelligence as this motivi motivating force to bring you to something like further. You know, you're not like a bookworm who's just piecing things together. You're not Iron Man who's just rebuilding the same suit to make it perfect. You're just, you're just this character who has this knowledge and knows that they can do great things and is now taking that out on the world around them. And building a character like that and building it really makes it appealing to me. Even though the alchemist has a lot of things that I don't like, which is just healing. Uh, if you take all that away, you still have some great ways to do things. You still have the awesome ability to be an artificer. And no matter what subclass you are, you are an artificer first. You're not like a warlock where you're a hexblade or, or you're a fiend pack where that's just what you are. And you're a warlock afterwards. Like you're not that. Like You are always an artificer first. And this is just your your specific focus and how that came about and what it affected you to do like it's dangerous to think of a healer that is evil because then he slowly meticulously picks and chooses who lives and who doesn't and that kind of power is definitely in the wrong hands if i play a character like that but this gives me that chance to do so while keeping me in the bounds of something that i like that i can play with that gives me a lot of range in what i want to do with my character we're now going to bring this video to a close. I want to send a special thank you to Josh for bringing up this concept and talking about the al alchemist and helping us kind of see it and what it is and try and see if we can turn that into something better. Uh, really appreciative for the inspiration that came out of us talking about uh, really the, the path of the beast barbarian. Uh, but it's very, very cool. And uh, thank you. And thank you all for all the people who have been commenting, all the people who have been subscribing and liking and sharing our videos. It means the world to us. Thank you so much for giving a spooky kid a chance.